How would you like it if you lived your whole life and God compared you in the Word of God to something completely and totally opposite to the way that God had compared or described His Son? I mean, directly opposite to how God had described His Son. We're going to look at this man tonight and the wording that's given in the Scriptures about this man. We're going to see it in 2 Chronicles chapter 21. When you find your place, please stand in honor of God's Word. 2 Chronicles chapter number 21. And look here in verse number... Let's read verse number 20. 2 Chronicles chapter 21 and verse number 20. Thirty and two years old was he when he began to reign, and he reigned in Jerusalem eight years, and departed without being desired. Howbeit they buried him in the city of David, but not with the sepulchres of the kings. It's an interesting passage of Scripture. We're going to look at this man tonight. Brother Jesse Brenner, would you ask God to bless the reading of His Word, please? Amen. You may be seated. The Bible tells us in Haggai chapter number 2 and verse number 6, it tells us that Jesus is the desire of all nations. That's what God said about Jesus in Haggai, that He's the desire of all nations. He is everything to be desired. Can you give me a good hearty amen to that? Amen. He's everything. He's altogether, altogether lovely. He is love. He's the Savior of the soul. As I said earlier, He's a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. No one in their right mind, if they knew who Jesus was, if they knew what He had done for them and understood that, would reject Him. He's the desire of all nations. He's the desire that everyone has, that void in their life. They may not know it or recognize it, but He is the desire of all nations. But here, in our text, we see someone who is just the complete, complete and total opposite of Jesus Christ. He is a diametrical opposition to how Jesus is described in the Word of God. This man's name is Jehoram. He was 40 years old when he died, and the Scripture says that he departed not being desired. Can you imagine being remembered like that? When he died, people were jubilant. They were happy the man had finally died. What in the world? After reigning for eight years in Jerusalem, he died, and the Bible says that he died or departed without being desired. No one missed him. Everyone was happy that he finally died. What a sad commentary the Word of God gives us about this apostate ruler that, that Israel once had. He was, the Bible says, buried, but not in the royal cemetery. No, the royal cemetery that was reserved for kings, the kings of Judah, and the city of David in Jerusalem, he fit that criteria, but he was not buried there with them. The nation, in essence, shouted, Good riddance, I'm glad he's gone. Ding dong, the king is dead. Amen, that's what they said. And I believe they probably sung, sung songs all about it. His death breathed a sigh of relief to all the people of God. His life was despicable. We're going to look at his life tonight. It really was despicable. And the people refused to bury him where all the other kings were buried. Let's look at his life. I want, to see, I want you to see a few things about him. Let's go to 2 Kings chapter number 8. 2 Kings chapter number 8. 2 Kings chapter number 8. Now as I give you the first point, I don't want anyone elbowing their neighbor. Okay? We see, first of all, he had a wicked wife. I didn't see anybody elbowing anyone. So praise the Lord. He had a wicked wife. Wife, 2 Kings chapter 8 and verse number 18. 
The Bible says, And he walked in the way of the kings of Israel, as did the house of Ahab, for the daughter of Ahab was his wife. And he did evil in the sight of the Lord. Now because this man Jehoram is his name, you'll see his name appear in the scripture in just a minute, he marries Ahab's daughter. Y'all remember how wicked Ahab was, right? He marries Ahab's daughter, and that wicked influence of Ahab's daughter, this wicked lineage of people being opposed to God and hating the things of God, was propagated through this woman, this wicked woman, to Jehoram. Look at it. It tells us in verse number 18, but go to 2 Kings chapter 11. Let's look at that verse. Chapter 11, verse number 1. Second Kings chapter 11 and verse number 1. And when Athaliah, the mother of Ahaziah, saw that her son was dead, she arose and destroyed all the seed royal. Now keep that in mind for just a moment. Look in Second Kings chapter 8 and look again at what we looked at before. Second Kings chapter 8 and verse number 18. Again, I want to read this. Um, the Bible says, And he walked in the way of the kings of Israel, as did the house of Ahab. For the daughter of Ahab was his wife, and he did evil in the sight of the Lord. Look in verse number 26. Two and twenty years old was Ahaziah when he began to reign, and he reigned one year in Jerusalem, and his mother's name was Athaliah the daughter of Omri, king of Israel. So according to 2 Kings chapter 8, verses 18 and verse number 26, Athaliah, or Athaliah, I saw people pronounce it differently as I studied this out, was the daughter of Ahab, king of Israel, thus the granddaughter of Omri. So here's this lady, a wicked lady. Now, she has this ungodly mindset that her dad had passed upon and on to her. As noted in our text that we read tonight, she, she really was a wicked lady. She proceeded to destroy all others of royal descent. We'll look at that in just a moment. So that she might seize the throne. That's what she ends up doing. And she's a wicked, wicked woman. The daughter of Ahab. Ahab has influenced his descendants because of his wicked lifestyle. She marries a man who later on becomes king. This man is, in, is infected because of his wife's ungodliness. We see, first of all, he had a wicked wife, but we see something else. He had a wicked life. Take your Bibles, turn to 2 Chronicles chapter 21. We read this a moment ago, but I want to show you some things in this passage of Scripture. We're going to look at a few verses here. 2 Chronicles chapter number 21, he had a wicked life. He had a wicked wife, first of all, he had a wicked life. Look in verse number 5 again. The Bible says here, Jehoram was thirty and two years old when he began to reign, and he reigned eighty years. In I'm sorry, Jehoram, I'm sorry, was thirty and two years old when he began to reign, and he reigned eight years in Jerusalem. So Jehoram was thirty-two years old when he began to reign. He reigns eight years there in Jerusalem. I did mention he married a wicked wife, right? I did mention that. Have, I, have, I, have we gone over that? The biggest influence in his life that we see in the Scriptures was a woman. How often do we see that? I mean, I'm not pointing fingers here, but the story's pretty clear. Who was the first to sin in the garden? It was Eve. Eve was deceived. Now, sinning when we are deceived is a little bit different than sinning willfully. Okay? She was deceived. It does not mean that that is an excuse, but she sinned and she was deceived. She believed the devil's lie is what she did. But Adam comes along. He doesn't believe the devil's lie. He just partakes of the fruit. Now we see it many times how women 
have a tendency to influence their man. Look at Samson. Samson was influenced by wicked women. We see it all through the scriptures how men, not much of a backbone, no, no, no standards, no convictions, they, <laughs> they, they allow their lives to be influenced by wicked women. How often do you see good godly young men affected by wicked women? We see that all the time. We see it quite frequently. And we, as men, listen men, we, we must, we must have some convictions and some standards and they must line up with the Scripture. And when there are influences, no matter how pretty, how sweet, how nice they seem to be, we cannot allow those influences to pull us away from God. Now, whether they be man or a woman, whatever the case may be, we can allow them to pull us away from God. He did. He chose a wicked wife, according to verse number 5. Look in verse number 6 of Second Chronicles chapter 21. He lived like the wicked rulers before him. The Bible says, And he walked in the way of the kings of Israel, like as did the house of Ahab. For he had the daughter of Ahab to wife, and he wrought that which was evil in the eyes of the Lord. So these wicked rulers before him, he decided, I'm going to emulate their behavior. He decided, I'm going to do what they did. I'm not going to do what God's people have done in the past. I'm going to do what the wicked people have done in the past. He emulated them. It was easy for him to do that. It was easy for him at home to do that because he had married a wicked lady. It's interesting, as you study his life out, we don't see him being described as being wicked or ungodly what we see is a wicked and ungodly influence in his life that produces a wicked and ungodly man. Our influences are so important. If you're running around with that crowd, that group of people that you used to run with before you got saved, if you run around with them, they will drag you down, pull you down. You may not get involved in the same sinful activity that you did before, but you mark it down, dear friend. Their behavior will cause you to become dull towards sin. And if he was going to have any peace at home, he was going to do what his wife wanted him to do. And he was going to continue down this wicked, ungodly path and he decided to emulate not the, the rulers that God had put in place that tried to emulate the, the godly rulers of the past. No, he tried to emulate the rulers before him that were ungodly. So he lived like the wicked rulers before him. And there's another little footnote here. That was easy for him because of the influence in his life. It was easy for him to pull the whole nation in a completely different direction because of one woman, one relationship, one person in his life. Notice something else. Look in verse number 11. He's an interesting gentleman. Uh, well, gentleman may not be the right word, but he's an interesting man in the Word of God. Look in verse number 11 of Second Chronicles chapter number 21. The Bible says, Moreover, he made high places in the mountains of Judah and caused the inhabitants of Jerusalem to commit fornication and compelled Judah thereto. Now, here's what he did. He began to promote the worship of Baal. The Bible says that he encouraged them to commit fornication. Now, in their worship of Baal, they committed fornication. That was part of their worship practices. They committed fornication. It was an ungodly... This, this type of worship was, it was adultery, just ungodly, ungodly things. I could go into some detail, but I couldn't do that in mixed company. Study it for yourself. I mean wickedly, abundantly, bestiality, ungodliness. 
was the wickedness that was promoted. He encouraged that kind of thing. Now, the Bible also talks about how that the nation of Israel went a whoring from time to time. We've well, seen that in the scriptures. Sometimes that means that they went a different direction spiritually. They became adulterous spiritually. When they began to worship Baal, they did both. They began, began to commit fornication and immorality, and they also began to get away from God, to get involved and invested in spiritual adultery. What makes this even to me more heinous is he took away the high places of God and turned them into high places of worship for Baal. He pulled the positive influences away from the people and then exalted the negative influences for the people. We see that in our nation today. For some strange reason, we know why, but our government's not real fond of Christianity as a whole. But they will promote abortion. They will promote false narratives about all kinds of different things. Push and promote, push and promote, push and promote. Did you see this week where um, Colin Kaepernick won? What did he win? Uh, what was it? Citizen of the Year. Did you see that? The guy that's been kneeling during our national anthem last year, the guy, he won Citizen of the Year. What does that do? That promotes a rebellion against authority. That promotes a rebellion against our military, those that put their lives on the line all the time, and they will say he's the greatest citizen in our society. <laughs> that is lunacy. But that is what this world promotes is lunacy. It's lunacy. And Christianity is pushed further and further back, and there are attacks today against us as Christians. It is evident and it is clear that they are pushing us out of the political forum. But he promoted Baal worship. Look in verse number 12. And there came a writing to him from Elijah. Well, that's interesting. God sent a written message from a prophet of God named Elijah. By the way, this is the only time Elijah's name is ever mentioned in the book of Chronicles. The only time his name comes up is right here. He writes a letter. He writes a letter to Jehoram, and he's trying to help him. He's trying to help him. Verse 12, And there came a writing to him from Elijah the prophet, saying, Thus saith the Lord God of David thy father, Because thou hast not walked in the ways of Jehoshaphat thy father, nor in the ways of Asa king of Judah. Now, he gets this letter. He turned. Now notice something else, too. There's something, a new revelation comes up in verse number 12 that we had not seen before or knew about. At least it wasn't depicted clearly like this. What did he do? He neglected and forsook the counsel and the influence of a godly daddy. Listen to me and listen to me very well. Some of you have young people downstairs in our youth department. The influence of your children is vital. Because if somebody comes along that shows a little interest in them, and they become infatuated with them because you're not interested in them. You have no investment or real love that you've shown toward them. They will quickly be pulled away from the God of their father that they feel as if, let them, as if they let them down. That's why we ought to be very cautious and careful how we treat our children, how we conduct ourselves around our children, he had a godly influence in his life. Matter of fact, we see that he had at least two. We see that he had at least two, and there were family members, people that I believe tried to influence him and tried to help him. But he, he decided one day, I'm going to go my own route. I'm going to do my own thing. I'm going to marry this lady, and she may not be perfect, but I'm going to marry her. And the next thing we know... He's in over his head getting a letter from a prophet of God trying to help him. 
He turned his back on a godly parent. You know, we see this over and over again, don't we, of, of young people turning their backs on godly parents. It is shameful and it is hurtful, but it is also something very relevant. And please don't think that your child is beyond it or above it. We must continue investing in their life because Satan has a bullseye on our homes. He had forsaken the ways of Jehoshaphat his father and Asa his grandfather. This third generation, he decided, I, he, he didn't say, I want a little bit of it. No, he's taking down their worship places. He's promoting ungodly worship, knowing that all this goes against the principles of God. He willingly and knowingly did all of this. Look in verse number 13. Let me show you something else he did. He killed his brethren. Verse 13, it says, and this is continuing the letter that Elijah wrote, but hast walked in the way of the kings of Israel and hast made Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to go a whoring like to the whoredoms of the house of Ahab, and also hast slain thy brethren of thy father's house, which were better than thyself. God confronts Jehoram for the murder of his six brothers all of whom God said was better than him. You know, I think we need to understand something here. There are people that will say, well, none of us are better than any... I mean, all of us are the same. Nobody's better than anybody else. Well, the Bible says that he told Jehoram that all of his brothers were better than him. Now, certainly I understand why people say that. I believe that, uh, that the ground is level at the foot of the cross. Amen, I believe that. From the bottom of my heart, I mean, even the harshest sinner can be born again. God, God can forgive sin. He has no problem with that whatsoever. But if we live a wicked, ungodly life, if we live a life devoted to ourselves, especially if we're in a place where we can lead, and we lead people away, we are no good, good for nothing. And God literally tells him in a letter. Can you imagine receiving this letter from the prophet of God? Those people you killed, they're better than you. He killed his own brothers. The descendants of a godly lineage. He killed his own brothers. To make it easier for him to establish his place, to have the throne, to do what he is doing, he did that. Now, look in verse number 14. I'm almost done. He incurred the wrath of God in verse 14. Behold, with a plague will the Lord smite thy people. Now, there is a part of me. Can I be honest right here? I'm a little jealous. I'm a little jealous of Elijah. I wish I could write a letter and say, because you did this, God's going to tear your hide in half now, you sorry, low-down, good-for-nothing. I wish I could do that, but I can't. God told Elijah to do it. And he writes this letter. We don't see an opportunity for him to repent. When God decides judgment is going to fall upon you, there is no backing up. There's no... When God says judgment's coming, judgment's coming. Okay? And when we cross the line, God says, all right, that's it. I'm done. I'm finished messing with you. Now judgment's coming. Elijah writes him a letter, tells him, reminds him what he did wrong, writes a list for him. Remember, I've been talking to you recently about if I were to give you some instructions about some areas in your life that were failing, how you would respond to it. Can you imagine if I gave you a lengthy list of things that you're doing wrong, how would you feel? And he's given this lengthy list, but he's not given an opportunity to do right. He says in verse number 14, Behold, with a great plague will the Lord smite thy people and thy children and thy wives and all thy goods. Then he says in verse 15, And thou shalt have great sickness by disease of thy bowels, until thy bowels fall out by reason of the sickness day by day. Do you see the description of what he's going through here? 
This is a serious case of dysentery where his bowels come out of his body over a period of time. And God inflicts this upon him. He incurred the wrath of God. God begins to send calamities, not just to him, but to his immediate family members and all of those that he cares most for. Our decisions in our life do affect a lot of people. All those people that we love, the people that we're responsible to and for, it really does affect them. It really does. And included his children, his wives, his immediate family. And the Bible says in all their goods, I believe he had a problem with things. And I believe that's why God began to judge him with his goods or by his goods. Now, in verse number 15, he gives some instructions about his sickness and his illness is going to come. What he did is he comes to the end of his life, he really in essence has lived for himself and not God. But he's really done more than that. You see, there's a difference between just living for yourself and not living for God and someone who directly and advertently promotes and pushes ungodliness upon people. There's a difference in that. And God says, I'm going to greatly judge you for what you've done, what you've pushed, and what you've promoted. Skip down to verse 18, and I'm done. I'm going to wrap this up. And after all this, the Lord smote him in his bowels with an incurable disease. And it came to pass that in the process of time, after the end of how long? Two years. It is described that God gives him this judgment, this incurable disease. God smote him in his bowels. So for two years, for two years, he endures great suffering and pain. And it says, look here, verse 19. His bowels fell out by reason of his sickness, so he died of sore diseases, and his people made no burning for him like the burning of his fathers. He died a lonely, cruel death. He died a lonely, unliked old man at 40 years of age. These are the details that we have of his life. This is really all that we know about him. There's a few other things right before he becomes king. But this is really all that we know about him. The main thing we see is that he had every opportunity that anyone could ever dream of, of living for God. He had the godly influence and an ancestry of not just good parents, great parents. Great men, great godly men that I believe tried to influence his life. But something deep-rooted inside of him said, no, I don't want that. And he went to the extreme to try to attain things for himself. Eight years he reigned. And from what we gather from the Scriptures, the last two years he suffered gruesomely. And he got to watch the death of his family members and the loss of his possessions when he had every opportunity that anyone could ever dream of. Did you know tonight you've been granted, God has been gracious to you, you have been granted some of the greatest opportunities of anyone in this nation or anyone in this world. You've been granted a loving, godly church that is avid about soul winning, avid in reaching people for Jesus Christ, people that are devoted to the cause of Christ. You've been given a great lineage spiritually. You have. And I'm afraid some of you are willing to forsake it. You may not promote ungodliness, but you certainly don't get as involved as your spiritual forefathers are. 
You leave that to them. You watch them and say, yeah, that's a good direction to go. That's a good thing, but I'm just going to kind of do my own thing over here. We'll see how that turns out. And I'm going to hang out with who I want to. And I'm going to have a desire for things and goods if I want to. And I'm going to allow people to influence me because I don't have real standards and convictions in my life, even though God has granted me these things. And I'm going to try to hide this from those around me. And then when that other generation is either old or gone, then they seize the opportunities this man does, did here to get as far away from God as he possibly could, to run the other direction. Tonight I want you to think about that. Do you fall in this category that you have been given and granted a lineage of godliness? Now listen to me. If you'll study the lives of his daddy and his granddaddy, they were not perfect men. They were not perfect men. They had some frailties, but they did walk in the ways of the Lord. They really, they really did. They loved God. They, they were not perfect men, but they loved God. Maybe, maybe, I don't know, the Bible doesn't say, maybe he picked out a little chink in their armor. Now help me with this reasoning, and I'm done. Maybe he picked out something in Daddy that just wasn't, wasn't quite right. Maybe he saw something and it just didn't line up with the way that daddy ought to conduct himself all the time. And that bothered him. It really bothered him that this guy over here, this guy that says he loves God, there's this little thing there and... And it just seems like he doesn't even notice it and he doesn't see it. And, 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 and as I said before, these men were not perfect. But, let me, but let's, let's think this through a little bit. So maybe he did see that. So he decides. Because of that, you know, I, just, I see maybe a little area where they're not doing so great. I'm going to go over here and let these people influence me instead of my daddy, instead of my grandpa, and instead of the people that are closest to them, the people that they spend time with, I'm going to let these other people influence me. I wish I had a nickel for every teenager I've seen do this. They will pick out something about someone in the church. Maybe that person's a little, little brash, maybe even sometimes rude, maybe even a little moody sometimes. Maybe I know a young person right now. I know a young man right now that's out of church. And the reason he says he's out of church is because he left a dirty plate promise. Left a dirty plate in the kitchen and two women came and said something to him about a dirty plate in the kitchen. And he allowed that and his excuse is, so that's why I went to the world. First of all, that's a stupid excuse. It's a stupid excuse, and it just it doesn't add up. It makes, it makes no sense whatsoever. But that's what Jehoram did, or possibly did. I don't know. I'm just assuming or guessing here. Again, this is Brother Brianology, all right? This is pastorology here. I don't know what, he, I don't know what his mindset was. But he thought he could handle it. He thought it wasn't that big of a deal. It cost him everything, and it cost him two years of suffering. I don't know, the Bible doesn't say, but this, the description that's given here, I think I probably would have begged God, please take me home. Please let me die. I am so sick. I am so wore out. Please let me die. But God made him suffer for two years. I don't want to see you suffer. I don't want to see the next generation suffer. I don't want their lives to be ruined because of a decision maybe that we make as spiritual leaders. But I also... I also don't want you to make a decision that completely and directly affects you and the next generation behind you and those that you're supposed to influence in a positive way. I don't want to see their lives destroyed because of our unwillingness. Unwillingness to submit to a holy God. Listen, you've been taught right. You've been given every resource every resource that you would ever need to be a great servant of God. Seize those, apply those, and be that example that God has intended for you to be. Father, we love you tonight. Lord, please take these thoughts and uh, use them to help our people, help our homes, 
help our lives to lift up your name. I have been given a great spiritual ancestry. We have seen and watched men and women of God that have influenced our lives and helped us, guided us, filled us with God's truth. Lord, may we follow what we've learned. Instead of looking for our own way and our own paths and then encamping ourselves around the people that have completely and directly opposed the work of God in generations before and in this generation today. Father, help us as parents to love our children, to instill in them a love for God, but not just a love for God, but also may they see God in us. When we're upset, may they see God in us. When we're disappointed, may they see God in us. When we are angry, may they see God in us. May they see God in us in everything that we do. Father, bless us and help us. In Jesus' name I pray. Every head bowed and every eye closed. I have given you what I believe God wanted me to give you tonight. Slow and steady. 